2010, don't worry about it. Maybe 2012 is the year. Companies are not going to invest on a poor bet. Thai institutions, according to the World Bank last year, Thai institutions have not facilitated the innovation and related technology highlighted by the World Bank, quote, as necessary for sustained growth. We're not talking theory or hypotheticals, we're talking facts. If the World Bank says this about what you're doing, it's not a happy moment. Well, let's look at levels of learning. Go back to education again. We have five levels. One, acquire. Acquire is when you get access to information, to ID technology. It's a starting point. Two, use. I take the ideas, I put them into practice. It's very good. We can call use practical knowledge, practical application. Three, reflection. Reflection is a higher level. We stand back, we look at what we acquired and what we're doing, and we think, can we do it better? Is there something that we're missing? We look to improve. Four, change. What can we do that others aren't to give us a strategic advantage? Five, how can we continuously be creative over time? Flow comes from the work of a motivational psychologist in Poland. His name is Michaeli Czesek Michaeli. And he looked at how to get people continuously operating at peak performance. And part of the answer to his research was continue to give people challenges that energize them so they can move forward. So my job as a manager or teacher is to level challenges step by step so you're continuously captured into it, you're involved as a result of the process. You strive and you perform well. Now we look at transformation. This section basically is about 10, 15 slides dealing with the foundation. Transformation is very simply put, the bridge from today to tomorrow. One thing, customer service. Narrowly look at it and only do that. Ignore the rest of the organization. Transformation says you're dealing with significant organizational change. And when you deal with it, Almost all aspects of an organization, to one degree or other, change. But the key word is where do you start? And the answer is vision. Because vision tells us where the leaders want to take us. Where should we position ourselves for the future? Problem is, if the vision is not broad based and pervasive, the vision changes every time you have a change in leadership. Look at the country of Italy. Italy is like Baskin Robbins. Every 10 or 12 months, they have another leader in Italy. Another party takes over. India was same thing with a multi-party system. The more you change leadership in the top and they come up with a new vision, they say, well, you know, I'm the new one in charge. What they said is not what I want to do. I'm going this way. How does that work for sustainability, for nation building, to build your children to be the leaders of tomorrow? It directly works against it and defeats the purpose. So we have to have a vision that is far reaching and important enough for everybody to buy into and say it's significant enough where politics and party and individual agenda is less important to the good of the nation. The good of the nation and our children is what we have to look to. Therefore, some questions when we deal with transformation. I put these in for you somewhat as a checklist. I won't go through every one here. But I wanted you to have not just a word, but I also wanted you to have a framework. Here are some more questions to address. Now, as we said already, 
Change does not happen simply by awareness, where you feel the heat, the pressure. Change happens when you accept the need to do something different, to listen, to participate, to hear, and to listen. Now, with acceptance, we move into how to change. This is a model that was developed by Matthew Miles. For 25 years, Miles was a business consultant working with the largest corporations in the United States. And then he stepped out of business and went to academia and was the dean of the Graduate School of Business at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And he said, you know, if you look at the learning I've had over 25 years in regard to change, there's a definite process and there are specific elements. If you understand them, you don't make mistakes. The one thing he did not include in his model, which I did, is leaders. Because we have to ask the question, where does vision come from? And the answer is vision comes out of leaders. If the quality of the leaders aren't good, the quality of the vision is not far reaching. Now, the leaders develop vision. The key thing to remember is after that, we have to look at the next step. One, you can institutionalize, or two, you can develop it strategically. The choice you make will determine your success or your failure. So, what should a vision include? Significant purpose. Well, in education, significant is to be nation building, to make Thailand competitive in the region and in the world, now and into the future. A picture of the future. What would Thailand be if your educational system was performing amongst the best in the world? How would that impact foreign investment? How would that impact the minimum wage? Rather than having it dictated, it would naturally accrue higher because there's competition to get the right kind of people working in those companies. Clear views should be present in a vision that people from all sides can buy into. Therefore, when we look at transformation, if leaders create vision, we have to ask what's next. If you start looking at structure, how big, how small, how many, you have failed already. This is where I have been getting tremendous business from many companies around the world that should not be hiring me back. And I keep on telling them that the same thing. They go from vision, really good, and then they start looking at restructuring and hiring more people, but they don't have their eye on the ball. They're not looking at the target. What you have to do, vision says, where are you going? Well, where you're going is, you want to compete against the best and brightest in the world. Your educational system, processes, teachers, and technologies have to leverage that. Okay, second question, strategy, how? Are you going to do it? With what? What plans, activities, programs, projects are you going to create which implements vision? Third, competencies. What skill sets do you need to be able to implement the strategies to achieve the vision? Example, some years ago, Ford Motor Company in the United States changed leaders. And the great-grandson of Henry Ford took over. The great-grandson is William Clay Ford III. Now, uh, he was an unusual choice. One, he was 32 years old. He had three children at the time, age four, seven, and nine. He was a tree hugger. He's the only head of an auto company in the world who was an environmentalist, a member of the Sierra Club. This is very unusual, given the fact that Ford manufactures the most cars in the world. So if you look at the automotive industry, Ford is the single biggest polluter in the world. 
He takes over as head of that company. And he gathers together the leaders of Ford for a retreat outside of Dearborn, Michigan. There's about 45 top leaders from all over the world. And they have four days. And the chairman, Bill, says, uh, gentlemen, I'd like you to come up with strategies to implement this vision. We will be the best, the most environmentally friendly, and we will be among the safest car manufacturing companies in the world. Your job, tell me how to do it. They divided into small groups, went into sessions. They came days later. Well, Chief, two options. Option A, 7.2 billion US dollars we can implement in 18 to 20 months. Option B, 17 to 19 billion dollars you won't see it in your products for seven to ten years. What would you like? He said, I'll take A. One month later, they bought Volvo. Why? Volvo is amongst the safest car companies in the world. And outside of their plant in Gothenburg, Sweden, I visited there several times. Outside their plant in Gothenburg, they have a research center that has on computer analyses of several hundred thousand car crashes. So they can simulate in design from CAD CAM stress points and survivability of passengers or driver before they even make a car. That's leveraging. So they had the strategy, then they went and looked, well, do we have, from Volvo we bought the patents. Do we have people skilled enough to implement this? It's somewhat like telephone companies around Asia and the Middle East. Telephone company moves from, move from fixed line to mobile. How many people here have a cell phone? Okay. How many of you have a telephone at home with a line that plugs into the... A lot fewer hands go up. Okay. Why? If you look at 8 million customers a year, they have lost because people are deciding mobile phones are good, I don't have to have a plug-in. That's a change. And if that's the future, that's their strategy, then we have to ask, well, how good are your people in engineering with applications for cell phones? And your PT Telcom in Malaysia. The difference between an age of a leader in PT Telcom in Malaysia or in Maxis or Cellcom, mobile carriers, 52 is the age of a manager in the National Telephone Company. 36 to 38 is the age in a cellular communication company. Why? Because the technology is different and the energy level is as well. So what we have to do is look from vision to strategy to competency. Then we have to rotate. We have to ask how big, how small. We have to look at infrastructure. If I want to change, here is where I have to look at how many schools, how many teachers. But then I also have to ask, what about the policies, the rules, the regulations? In companies around the world, including Thailand, how many of you have seen memos come from someone in human resources? You know, we read policies of HR and personnel Take chapter three, throw it in the garbage. Doesn't apply anymore. Take chapter seven and change it this way. We change the vision, the strategy, the values. But the curious thing, policies, rules, regulations, and procedures quite often don't change. What happens? Like driving one foot on the gas, one on the brake. What's the result? You burn out your brakes and you don't get very far. So what we have to look at is, these are secondary to the strategic framework. With that in place, we can look at culture in the organization, and we can look at the kind of people we need and how we have to develop them. Now, with that in place, look at strategy. 
Strategy is not about what you did, it's about what you need to do to move to the future. Strategy is always future-oriented. It's not maintenance, treading water. We have two kinds of strategy. One is what I call float all boats. Good enough. This strategy says, what should we do? Well, we're down here, raise everybody up so they are average, or maybe a little bit better. Is that a national strategy for competitiveness and easy? Raise them up, be a little better than average. This is a strategy for defeat. You have seen, with regard to the cost of labor for manufacturing, in Asia the past 10 years. Malaysia used to be a low-cost producer until wages in uh, Silangor and some of the other states started raising. Then they came to Thailand. Then they went to China. Now they're coming out of China. They're going to Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. Do you want to be caught in the death spiral of running to the bottom? Or do you want to climb to the top? This is a strategy choice. And the answer to the question will forever impact what happens next. So this here, you can do it. It gives you a floor, but medium to long term, it doesn't give you competitiveness. Charles Handy is a futurist based in England. He's one of the leading theoreticians in terms of change. And he basically says, good enough is the enemy of great. I'm satisfied. Or in Singapore, they say, okay law. Okay law, no problem. Or you say, I can ride, that's okay law. Okay. But I don't want, think you want to have the future of your children and your grandchildren be okay law. I think you want to have a bright future with opportunity. And to do that, you need a focus strategy. A focus strategy says, look at where you are good and can build. And then leverage your resources, your talent, your institutions towards that. One of the best examples recently in the last five to 10 years is in the Middle East in a country called Qatar. Qatar, the entire population of Qataris before expats, if you stretch it, is 220,000 people. Somewhat like some years ago, I used to do training in the Sultanate of Brunei. It was very small, and I remember when I did training there, the first day I used to be a consultant to the Strategic Planning Division of the Ministry of Defense. And the first day I started this training, the head of training came up to me and said, Jerry, where's your bill? I said, I'll give it to you at the end of the week. That's good enough. She said, no, the boss wants it now. I said, how about if I give it to you tomorrow? Okay. Who was the boss? The Sultan. The Sultan personally signed my check. So the next day I bring it in, 7.30 in the morning, I give it to the head of training. It goes to the Sultan's office. By 11 o'clock that morning, the money was in my bank in Pittsburgh. In my life, it never happened with any other client. Why? Because the Sultan of Brunei was extremely active. He was an active leader. He set a clear vision, wanted it to happen. Well, in Qatar, they're doing the same thing. Qatar knows it cannot compete against Dubai for shopping. It can't be everything to everyone. So it's selecting its battles. One of those selections is international sporting competitions. They have hosted the uh, Asian Games, they're on the board for the World Cup, they're bidding for the Olympics, they have regional and international tennis tournaments, the Volvo Cup is there, they have an F1 uh, motorcycle circuit, and we can go down a long list. They are choosing 
That is one. Second focus strategically they have chosen is conferences, educational exchange. All over the region, they are coming to Qatar to have those kinds of meetings. Third, they are choosing education. I'll illustrate that in a few minutes. But they're selecting their battles. Instead of doing a hundred things, they're selecting a few, but doing them extremely well. The excellence strategy. The excellence strategy is look at what you're good at and build on it. Now, we do this in organizations for high potential employees or high potential students as well. If I have a limited number, amount of budget and I want to get the maximum return, what is the difference between getting a whole bunch of people up to average versus a few people up to world class? That's the question. If we look at hospitals, the value of having a world-class neurosurgeon is worth millions in income to the hospital and reputation. So the question is, how do you grow your best and brightest? Well, we have an answer. What kind of programs do you have? for high potentials. What kind of programs do you have that identify your best students early? I know you have, and you have distinguished with regard to the International Olympics, math, physics, biology, astronomy. You've got those. How early do you start? How wide is your scope? In the United States, we have a program in seven grade, you take a test. The test is called the California Achievement Test. And that test, within a month, the results are out. And within two weeks, those results are shared with the best universities in the United States. One of those is Johns Hopkins University, which are talented youth. What do they do? They look at the top 3% of students in a grade year. They're 13 years old. The top 3% in the United States sums to 32,000 students. They get this list, and Johns Hopkins sends out a letter. We have an opportunity for you. Are you interested? The, but to get into this opportunity, you have to take a test. What is the test? You take the admission test to the university. Normally, you would take that in your senior year, 12th grade. You take it at 13 years old. I'm aware of this. My son took that test at 13. Now, if you score well in that test, then Hopkins says, we want you to take another test. So that first test, lowers from 32 to about 12,000. The second test goes from 12 to 360 times two. They have summer session one and two, that's it. They accept 720 students. But those are the best, the brightest. And Hopkins then takes you and they put you into class with some of the best and the brightest. My son could, took a course on uh, Advanced Applied Mathematics. Who was his teacher? The chairman of the mathematics department at Yale University. That was 13 years old. Eighth grade, Don took a course in genetics. Who was the teacher? A stem cell re researcher from Montreal, Canada. One of the national leaders in his field. He took another course on genomics. He took a course on cryptography. I didn't even know what he was studying, but he'd come home and say, I'd say, Don, what did you like most about this course? Quantum physics, Dad, and quantum computing. This was really great. I'm the foggiest of this. I'm the one who talks. Luck is the one with the science. So she understood. I had no idea. 
But what we're saying is, you have to have programs for your high achievers. You also have to have programs for those who are challenged. How do vision and strategy relate to plans and budgets? Here, this maps out the macro. This maps out how we implement, in fact. So, with that in place, what you need as a nation is on the top. How you get it is on the bottom, and that's your education system. The rules of the game have changed, and the rules of engagement have changed. Getting back to your historic competencies will only accelerate your losses. It's a real nice way to say, if you keep on doing the old thing, but you do it very well, that doesn't mean you're a winner. So when we look at competencies, I've been setting up competency-based system for companies and governments around the world. Some years ago, I was asked to go into the Kingdom of Jordan and help them to identify leadership competencies for future ministry. That was an interesting piece. The critical thing that we want to look at is, what are your distinctive competencies versus, versus which are the basic ones? The basic ones are commoditized easy to replace. In short, who pays the cheapest gets the business. But the distinctive competencies are the things that leverage excellence, that set you apart, that give you a competitive advantage. So what you have to identify is how to get here, not just how to stay there. So our change process is what? This model is where you are. It has all the pieces. But if the vision changes, now I have to look at the old strategy and say, can the strategy of the past meet the vision of the future? If the answer is no, then how does it have to change? When we get strategy in place, then I have to look at the old concepts. Are they good enough to give us lift to achieve the new strategy? If no, change the competency. Don't go further. So the message is, if the vision is not clear, the strategies aren't focused, you're wasting your time on change. Now, we'll ask two questions. Let's look at change for a minute. We know that change is important, and I'd like you to look at Thai education, and I'd like you to answer three questions, okay? Question number one, what is Thailand doing in the field of education that it should no longer do? Worked in the past, but it's not going to give you a lift in the future. What's the old stuff? It was nice to have, but you don't need it anymore. Get rid of it. So looking at Thai education, what are you doing that you should not be doing? Question number one. Because in psychology, we know we remember the negative before the positive, and the average kind of floats away in the middle. Question number two. What should you be doing education that you are not doing today. But if you did it, it would give you great opportunity. What should you be doing that you're not doing? That's the second category. Okay? Category number three. What should you change or modify in Thai education so you can get a far better result? What should you change or modify in Thai education to give you a far better result? Okay? Now, with that in place, what I'd like to do is recognize the fact that uh, we have another set of key pieces to go into, and when we start them, 
we have to continue. Uh, I'd like to propose a five minute break. Stand up, stretch, go around the corner, but come back a little fresh. Because instead of looking at models and where you've been, we have to look at change and where you're going. Okay? Take five minutes, come back, and then we will continue. Kapoka. Thank you, Professor, for allowing us to have a short break. We'll resume the session again um, at 10 to 11. 10 to 11, thank you. <laughs>